For those of you tuning in for the first time, uh, I'm uh, Max Donath, and I welcome you to the seminar series on advanced transportation technology. Uh, this is open to transportation professionals, and uh, it is both uh, available to you who are sitting here in the room, and it's also available live uh, on the internet and is actually archived uh, right afterwards. So if you tune in, uh, I, I checked uh, last week, and uh, right after uh, the seminar was over, I was able to watch the whole thing again, if I forgot anything about it. Anyway, uh, we have uh, 19 students registered for this class, and I just remind, want to remind the students here uh, that uh, in order to get credit, you have to attend 10 of the 11 seminars uh, in the semester and turn in five short reports on uh, summarizing uh, five of those seminars during the, uh, of the 11 that are offered here. Anyway, uh, let me pass the mic to uh, Kylie Bivens, who will tell you a little more about some housekeeping and uh, the chat lines and everything else. Thanks, Max. Uh, for those of you in the audience that don't know, this seminar is also streamed on YouTube live as a webinar. Uh, so if you're wondering why you can't hear out of this, it's because it's streaming on the seminar or on the webinar. So for our YouTube live viewers, please go into the chat box and register and write in your name, affiliation, and number of people viewing. Um, that helps us so that we can report our viewership to the USDOT. Um, and for those that are remotely viewing, please put all of your questions into the chat box that you're registering in, and we will address your questions at the end of the seminar. Um, for those of you in the audience, please save all of your questions until the end, at which time we will bring the mic around for you to um, ask your questions so that we can hear you in the seminar or on the webinar. Um, other than that, I'll hand it back to Max. I just want to introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Frank Dama, uh, has uh, been uh, with the university quite some time. Uh, he received a law degree uh, from the university in 1996 and a master's of public administration in 95 from the Humphrey School. Uh, so uh, for those of you who are registered uh, in the Humphrey School, he's one of yours. Uh, he is also uh, the, since this past uh, October, so it's almost a year. Uh, he's been the director of the state and local policy program at the Humphrey School and has been involved in a lot of policy-related work over the years, everything from uh, seat primary seatbelt laws, speeding laws, automated speed enforcement, mileage-based user fees. I could go on and on. And most recently, he's been involved with the laws associated uh, with self-driving vehicles, so this new issue of what kind of regulations do we need to have in place. So anyway, without further ado, uh, Frank's gonna talk about perceptions and impacts of speeding laws and policies in Minnesota. Thank you, Max, and uh, thank you to the Roadway Safety Institute for the uh, invitation to speak, and thank you all for attending. Um, yeah, it's uh, been lots of interesting things I've done. It doesn't seem like I've been here that many years, uh, but uh, I, I guess I have. Uh, it's been relatively famously noted that when we get to the world of self-driving cars, self-driving cars uh, will not speed. And so uh, this topic will no longer necessarily be relevant. Re rele relevant. But uh, for the uh, meantime, uh, it's uh, something that we do need to continue to be concerned about. Speeding is, uh, by all or most measures, a, a safety issue in the United States. Compared to 19 other high-income countries, uh, the U.S. has the most motor vehicle fatalities uh, per 100,000 population and 10,000 registered vehicles. And speed's a factor in about a third of all fatal crashes uh, in the United States. And the uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has estimated that that results in uh, over $50 billion just in direct costs related to the uh, crashes, not related to lost income, uh, lower, lowered well-being, and so forth. Uh, 
speeding uh, increases the severity of a crash. That should be fairly intuitive, but uh, when you're uh, going 80 miles an hour, that does not seem to enter into some people's mind. Uh, and uh, it also varies by gender and age. Uh, so as you get older, uh, you have some reassurance that uh, uh, you will not be in a speed-related crash, similarly if you're female, but uh, that does not necessarily uh, reduce the uh, scope and magnitude of the problem. In 2014, among all fatal crashes, speeding was actually the leading factor. Uh, greater, almost greater than uh, alcohol and distracted driving uh, combined, uh, which were the next uh, two factors, and the factors that people most often will cite as uh, safety issues uh, when it comes to, to driving. So speed is a definite factor, but not one that is as well known. And people don't necessarily believe it's a factor. Uh, another survey found that about a third of respondents said they enjoy the feeling of speed, more than half get impatient being stuck behind that slow driver in front of them. And uh, as I'll talk about later with some uh, specific numbers, uh, exceeding the, post the posted speed limit is a relatively common practice uh, in the US, although I will not ask you to raise your hand about uh, whether it's happened to you today. So recognizing that it seems we have a safety issue here that people are not recognizing one possible solution is to ramp up the enforcement of those laws. And one way to do that is uh, to use automated enforcement. Uh, basically the idea that uh, you can uh, issue a ticket through a combination of radars and cameras by the side of the road. This is uh, work that was funded by the Roadway Safety Institute. Uh, the uh, uh, large share of the research and credit goes to Colleen Peterson, who's a PhD student in public health that worked with me on this. Uh, also indebted to uh, Dr. Nicole Morris, who's actually here with us today. Uh, and uh, she provided some very, very, very useful uh, and valuable input into the process and the questions, as well as uh, the analysis. So automated speed enforcement becomes part of the discussion because there have been studies where it's deployed that it does reduce the average speed on uh, the roadway and it does reduce the crash rates. Uh, it reduces the injuries and fatalities, uh, especially the, se the severity of those uh, uh, injuries and fatalities in a crash. Uh, and uh, properly deployed, it can uh, reduce uh, speeds over the whole network. Uh, although there are risks in times of having halo effects where if folks know where it begins and ends, they will speed outside of those uh, boundaries. It's a topic in Minnesota and one that becomes very interesting, I think, uh, from uh, not just a state perspective, but nationally because of the background we have here. Uh, controlling speed has continued to be an issue uh, in Minnesota. Uh, for trying to improve highway safety. And uh, as I've mentioned, uh, there have been studies to show that it's an effective tool for doing that. There are 15 states plus Washington, D.C. that do allow uh, deployment of automated speed enforcement, but Minnesota is not one of them. As Max mentioned when I uh, was introduced, this is something I've looked at for a while. Uh, looking at the question of why we don't have uh, automated speed enforcement, we did a, a public opinion survey where we asked would they favor seeing automated speed enforcement on all roads, just roads where people violate the speed limit, roads where people have died, just on roads near schools, or just on roads uh, where workers are endangered. And as you can see, the results showed that there was not a lot of support for putting them on all roads but on areas where you have vulnerable populations like schools or work zones, not only was there a great level of support from uh, somewhat to very supportive, but there was an over 50% uh, support for uh, very supportive of, in those, of those two locations. So it would seem that if you just did a public survey, opinion survey and that were to uh, carry the day in the legislature that we might see some kind of limited deployment in Minnesota. However, it's not gotten to that point. Uh, 
it got to the point of actually being explicitly stated in Minnesota's 2007 Strategic Highway Safety Plan as something that would be deployed as a safety measure. But at about that same time, Minneapolis was working to deploy uh, red light enforcement cameras uh, in the city. And a couple of years later, I think it was 2009, uh, the Sup Minnesota Supreme Court ruled that uh, Minneapolis uh, did not have the legal authority to deploy those cameras. Because it was an opinion issued by the Minnesota Supreme Court, it created the perception that this is a constitutional issue, that uh, it infringes our rights as residents of the United States and the state of Minnesota to uh, have remote enforcement on our roadways. Uh, as I'll talk about, that is not accurate. But with that perception, those that did not want to see deployment of automated enforcement uh, gained the upper hand in the political arena. So as we started this work, uh, this particular project, we wanted to uh, build upon that research where we had done the public opinion survey, looked at some of the other potential safety impacts and so forth, and talk with the stakeholders, those who might really influence uh, the public debate about their perceptions of, of what is good and what is the problem with automated uh, speed enforcement in particular. Uh, we grouped them into law enforcement. We actually talked with uh, local and, uh, and state uh, representatives of uh, police and, and state patrol. Non-enforcement government, which uh, included legislators. Uh, we talked with a couple of judges uh, and uh, a number of public health officials as well, since they're the ones who are really looking at the issue of um, the injuries and fatalities that come, out, come from speeding. We created a, this chart, which is a little bit hard to read, uh, conveying, first of all, the point of view that the answers were wide and varied. Um, what you can see, or that I'll point out, is on the upper right, uh, there was strong agreement that the safety impacts were desirable and supported. But on the other hand, there were lots of reasons given for why, despite those safety benefits, uh, automated enforcement was not uh, going to be very um, viewed very favorably at the higher decision-making levels. Everything from fears of big government to invasion of privacy to the idea that indeed it violates constitutional due process rights and so forth uh, came up and uh, created quite the, the mismatch of uh, perspectives in terms of how would you go forward to address those issues. We followed that up uh, this last year with an online survey, almost a, uh, a, an online focus group of Minnesota drivers to try to determine what is getting behind all of these perceptions or uh, expressed opinions about uh, why they oppose automated speed enforcement. Um, we thought this might uh, help identify issues for targeted communications. We thought that these lessons may apply in other states that are facing similar uh, issues. In the survey, we uh, asked, uh, first of all, just basic demographic questions. I uh, wanted to get a feel for uh, whether we were covering a number of different demographic groups. We asked about their driving habits and history. Had they been pulled over for speeding before? Did they uh, routinely uh, believe that the speed limit was something they had to follow, et cetera. After getting those, that background information, we then read them this definition of automated speed enforcement uh, as something that involves using roadside technologies that combine radar and image capturing capabilities, also known as a camera. These technologies identify when a vehicle is speeding and capture an image of the vehicle's license plates and, if called for, an image of the vehicle's driver. A fairly wide uh, but generic uh, perspective about what automated speed enforcement could be. And then came straight out to cut to the chase and asked, do you think automated speed enforcement is a good idea? And they were given uh, the usual five range, five step Likert scale, definitely yes, probably yes, unsure, probably not, and definitely not. If they said that they were in favor 
uh, we then ask them for their reason, what motivates their support, and uh, did not go much further. We thanked them for their, for their participation and, and moved on. If they said they were unsure about it, or they probably did not, or definitely did not favor automated speed enforcement, we then return to those issues that I had put up on the chart there and listed them out. One advantage of an online survey versus a telephone survey is you could list them out on one screen instead of having to read all of them. Ask the respondents to choose their top two reasons and then we followed up with a number of tailored questions and prompts to uh, explore uh, why they held that opinion and how strongly they held it and then asked if, uh, at the end if their opinion had changed after we had had this, if you will, online discussion. Again, the issues ranged from a belief that automated speed enforcement is not constitutional, uh, a practical issue of automated speed enforcement would make the owner of the car responsible for tickets regardless of whether the owner is actually driving. It has an impact on the uh, law the duties carried out by law enforcement that is not good, simply it won't work, that it would not be implemented fairly, that the public doesn't support it, so therefore don't go forward. Uh, automated speed enforcement is merely a money maker as opposed to being a safety uh, measure. Uh, it's an invasion of the driver's privacy uh, and or it uh, expands the reach and the control of government. One method we employed in the uh, discussion here was the idea of uh, following up with a consider the opposite question. Uh, this is an example that uh, if they said um, that the public for, uh, was not going to support automated speed enforcement, we then asked the question, well, if they knew what the speed impacts were of going too fast, uh, do you think they would be less likely to speed? or maybe would be uh, more likely to support automated speed enforcement. And uh, if uh, they still didn't really get much of an answer out of that, we also gave them an opportunity to learn more information about a specific topic, even to the point of uh, if they were talking about the constitutionality or the legality, uh, we uh, provided a synopsis of the Supreme Court, Minnesota Supreme Court opinion regarding red light cameras. As Max mentioned, I have a law degree. I thought everybody should start to know that. What results did we get? We had uh, just over 200 respondents, uh, which we uh, pulled from uh, general advertisements on Craigslist. We used the tool called Reach Research Match, which uh, people sign up for saying they're interested in taking surveys, a few other measures. We uh, were aiming for a population of Minnesotans, and we largely got that. Um, three, almost three quarters were female. That's not quite representative, but again, I'm saying this, this was done so, kind of like an online focus group rather than uh, a real sort of uh, public opinion survey. A wide range of ages and a wide range of experience uh, in terms of how long they've been driving. And of those that said that they were unsure or did not support automated speed enforcement, the most common answers were that it makes the owner of the car responsible for tickets regardless of who is driving, and it expands the reach and control of government. Immediately next was automated speed enforcement is an invasion of the driver's privacy. This becomes an issue when you're looking at the question of um, who is responsible versus invading the privacy of who's in the car. Because if you can't see who's in the car, then how do you hold the actual driver responsible? We found about 50% support. Uh, they uh, were more likely to be older if they supported it and uh, they were likely to support it largely for safety reasons. This confirms what we had seen elsewhere. Those uh, who were not in favor had driven more miles in the last year, uh, and of all of those who were not in favor, it was almost a three-way split. 30 were unsure, 30 thought it was probably not a good idea, 43 were very solid that they did not like the idea at all. 
after having this online conversation with them, we uh, uh, found that about half of those did not change their opinion. The other half did change their opinion. Um, and uh, not quite 40, 80 percent of those moved in a positive direction. They went from uh, feeling um, definitely against the probably or unsure or similarly uh, in the positive direction, but there were 11 that moved from unsure or probably against to a more negative opinion. Um, these were found uh, through a statistical analysis to actually be a significant uh, number of changes. Uh, again, this is a, a graphic presentation here. The black lines are those who started as definitely not, and uh, we saw 11 of those move up to probably not, um, and a couple of them moved to unsure and even uh, probably yes. Um, and then the, the blue were probably not, and we can see they moved a little bit in both directions, mostly to the positive side. And those who were unsure um, kind of went 50-50 to the positive and the negative. So once you gave them more information, they felt they just were more able to make a decision. Those who moved in a positive direction tended to have a higher educational attainment, uh, also tended to be women. We did not look into exactly why that happened to be, but um, since we're at a university, I will speculate that those who have a higher educational attainment were at least willing to hear opposite sides and consider questions and change their mind, but that's speculation. Um, those who drove more frequently were more likely to move in a negative direction. So we again see the people who have higher mileage driving are less in favor of seeing uh, automated speed enforcement. Those who moved in the positive direction, again, safety was the big deal. When we pointed out the safety issues, the magnitude of the safety problem that comes with speeding, we saw answers that said data-driven dri decision-making makes this more acceptable to me. Results prove more progress than anything, so they wanted that data. And this should definitely be only done as a public safety measure. They didn't want to hear about any of the other things that can happen, like a large amount of money is made sometimes, or uh, any other sorts of uh, issues that come along. Again, those who were already positive, uh, a majority highlighted safety as part of their reasons for supporting it. Over two-thirds, again, supported, as we saw in the public opinion survey, the idea that let's not send a ticket to somebody who's doing 56 miles an hour in a 55 zone. Let's you only send the ticket when, we, when the, the camera and the radar note that they are excessively exceeding the speed limit something that would become, be perceived, not only um, be dangerous, but also be perceived and uncomfortable uh, as, as dangerous to other drivers. Um, it recognized also the importance of uh, speed in work and school zones. Uh, and uh, so this, again, confirmed everything that we saw in the original public opinion survey. Even those who did not changed their opinion, said they were probably not in favor of it and so forth, felt that the school and work zones would be something that they uh, would uh, at least be open to. Uh, they wouldn't oppose that. Now moving on to those who moved in a negative direction or did not change. This is where we got to some findings that uh, were more interesting or that we hadn't uncovered before. This one was somewhat disheartening as a person from law school, explaining that the court did not say automated speed enforcement is unconstitutional, didn't do anything. They appeared to believe they were the best judges of what is constitutional or not, and uh, stated what their rights were. And so therefore, uh, it would, violate their rights or what they believed is their rights and that they would not believe that they, it was ever constitutional regardless of whether the Supreme Court were to uh, change, uh, find a uh, constitutional uh, method of implementing. Uh, and uh, others said uh, they want the Supreme Court of the United States to weigh in. 
Again, as an attorney, this is an answer that roils me a bit since regulation of speeds is largely a state issue. But that didn't make a difference to the respondents. Also, as I mentioned, the uh, high, two of the three highest uh, reasons for opposing were that uh, the owner being held, held uh, responsible, but on the other hand, little support for taking picture of the driver. Uh, some had had a negative experience with red light cameras in other places. You can understand why that would cause them to not want to have to deal with the picture. They claim it, it's not accurate. It could look, they could look like uh, someone else, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, essentially, though, it creates a, uh, a chicken and egg situation in terms of how are you going to implement this in a way that would uh, actually address those concerns. And there were some who appreciate the idea of a human police officer giving them the ticket. Whether that is because they believe uh, that they could maybe talk the officer out of it, or they believe they're not the ones that's be that are being pulled over and they like the idea that the officer might be able to find some other more significant crime going on in the car by being there. Um, the, uh, both changers and non-changers notice the flip side of this, that uh, you remove the potential for discrimination by the police officer if you have just a camera taking a picture. Uh, but on the other hand, there uh, was a feel for we need more humanity in the way we regulate ourselves, not less. Uh, and uh, the idea, like the idea that uh, the police officer has some discretion. Uh, if you have a really good reason to be exceeding the speed limit by that much, they might let you go or what have you. Others did not recognize when it comes to safety on the roads, just how significant speeding is. They didn't make that connection, and they believed there were other issues that were more uh, important. Why are we concerned with speeding when there are many more problematic driving beha behaviors that need to cease first? Distracted driving, running red lights, not stopping for pedestrians are a much higher concern for me than speeding. We did not present this person with the data about speeding being uh, the cause uh, as much as distracted driving and alcohol, but a, a view like that probably would not be influenced even though that's the facts. Another uh, person who went in the wrong direction said, I shouldn't say wrong direction, the negative direction. Um, you work with these things long enough and you start to form your own opinions, but I pull myself back. I don't think this is a good use of taxpayers' money and law or law enforcement's time. There are more important issues than speeding drivers. This is a person who went from unsure, probably not, to probably not, definitely not. Even though there is information showing that if you deploy automated speed enforcement, you can deploy the officers to, uh, the human officers to address these greater issues. So that's, that's another interesting uh, finding. And the one that caught my attention the most is those that just did not believe the statistics about speeding and safety. Speed is seldom the underlying issues in driving accidents. Some decided they'd heard enough about this that they were going to be a smart aleck about it. Speed has never killed anyone. It's suddenly becoming still that kills you. Um, but even after we gave information on speed and safety, uh, we still got answers of that's too small of a portion of the root cause of traffic accidents and fatalities. So what do we conclude from this? Again, the safety impacts does not seem to be getting into the public conversation in a way that is uh, impactful. Um, stakeholders don't seem to be aware uh, of, of the issue and some openly deny that uh, uh, speeding is, is an issue. Interestingly enough, when we did the interviews with the stakeholders, none of them said, I believe automated speed enforcement is a problem or should not be implemented because speeding is not a problem. They all agreed that speeding was a problem. But the public came out and said, well, we don't think it's a problem. 
trying to engage on the question of legalities and privacy is not going to be the way to change that conversation. The constitutionality seems to be a dead-end topic. Explaining what the Supreme Court actually ruled did not make any uh, difference in the, in, in the way they moved. And uh, describing the extensive privacy safeguard, safeguards that can be built into an automated speed enforcement program did not cause anyone to feel any less like Big Brother was going to be watching them. Limited deployment also is a very positive way to be talking about automated speed enforcement. There was broad support for the idea of uh, automated speed enforcement in work zones or uh, in school zones. Um, many were explicitly against automated speed enforcement in all forms except for those uh, high risk areas. And uh, this is consistent with, the, as I mentioned, um, not only our own uh, public opinion polls, but even national opinion polls that show uh, support um, for many of these places uh, and including uh, where there's extreme speeds uh, being uh, used. Now being in an academic setting, I should point out that you know this was not the world's most perfect survey. This is uh, one set of results. Uh, it could be uh, improved um, by trying to further build on the awareness of automated speed enforcement and the benefits. Um, we didn't give all the same information. We didn't want to create a four hour online survey. Nobody would complete it. But uh, as a result that meant we only had, if you will, discussions about uh, the top two reasons that they cited. And uh, if we had been able to provide all of the safety information, maybe there would have been more movement. Uh, similarly, by having nine different options and uh, just the uh, capacity in the survey for, for 200 respondents and 100 of them were in, were in favor, some of the uh, responses for these uh, um, different reasons were quite small and certainly not enough to generalize from, although their answers were nonetheless uh, illustrative. Another is that the online survey format um, allowed respondents to leave the open-ended questions blank. So uh, we could have some other reasons for not supporting or supporting uh, out there that were not articulated because someone just didn't want to take the time to, to type it into the box. Um, versus a, a phone uh, voice survey, you often can get someone to say something at least. So this uh, set of, uh, this, this study gave us a fair amount of information about why people might not support automated speed enforcement. But it didn't necessarily get us to the question about why they speed in the first place. Uh, and to, to look at this question, uh, I'm turning to another study that we, had, uh, we did. Uh, this one uh, was for the Minnesota Department of Transportation as requested by uh, the state legislature. Not looking at automated speed enforcement, but looking in particular uh, at uh, issues and impacts related to uh, a law in Minnesota that is referred to as the Dimmler Amendment. And this time I'll, I'll, I'll just ask, is anybody here familiar with what the Dimmler Amendment is? I see one, and that's, that's Max, who, who's heard me give this talk. Um, this is part of what's very interesting about the regulatory regime uh, in Minnesota. If you receive your basic speeding ticket in Minnesota, it is recorded by the court where you pay the fine or even contest it and then lose. If you win, then it's not recorded. Uh, it's also recorded by uh, the State Department of Vehicle Services. That latter information is made available to third party data aggregators who purchase this information and then make their money back by selling that information to insurance companies and others that uh, have the legal right to, to get that information. Um, and uh, this is uh, in large part used to determine what your auto insurance premium is uh, among other things. Dimmler information, which I'll explain in a minute, is 
not recorded by the Department of Vehicle Services, so it is not as widely available. It is, however, uh, still recorded by the courts. What is Dimmler information? Well, since 1986, and uh, again, this doesn't seem that long ago, but maybe it is, when uh, Congress threatened to withhold federal highway funds from any state that did not have a 55 mile an hour speed limit. Um, there were states, including Minnesota, that felt, well, it's important to get those federal highway funds, but boy, we don't like being told what the speed limit is. So they uh, created this exemption that said uh, if you were uh, going greater than 10 miles an hour in excess of the lawful speed limit as designated in a certain section, which basically uh, was 50, 55 miles an hour. Uh, you would have to pay the ticket, but if you were less than 10 over, it would not be recorded uh, by uh, driver and vehicle services. Um, the 55 mile an hour requirement from Congress went away, and uh, so then, Minda, then the state uh, changed the uh, restriction to posted speed limits of 55 and 60. The current version is, uh, was enacted in 2012. We came in for a version that had a very short life in 2014 that kept 10 miles an hour to 55 and 60, but what it is now is uh, up to 65 miles an hour in those two posted speed limit zones, if that's clear. In application, it only applies to posted speed limits, not road types. Uh, so uh, whether you are in an area that would give you a Dimmler uh, ex exception is basically just what's the sign on the side of the road. Um, and uh, uh, most road types would uh, be uh, those including freeways, interstates, expressways, as well as uh, a large majority of the uh, two-lane two-way highways, uh, uh, rural highways uh, in greater Minnesota. Back to the question of automated speed enforcement and people not believing that speed is a real safety issue, we had the opportunity as part of this project to ask people how much they were aware of the Dimmler Amendment. And this comes from the fact that Minnesota already has uh, a very legalistic definition of speeding that varies depending upon the road you're on. I can get into that in questions, but um, having already been chastised in the previous study about being too interested in law and policy and other people not wanting to listen to it, I'll skip that part for now. But the idea of Dimmler making speeding a less severe violation in certain speed zones created another level of confusion. When asked explicitly about, uh, by, by the, the state of Minnesota, uh, MnDOT sponsored a question that was done in a state, statewide survey uh, about the impact of the Dimmler Amendment. As I said, the actual law says Dimmler applies if you're five or 10 miles an hour, up to five or 10 miles an hour over, depending whether you're in a 60 or a 55 zone, respectively. The answers came, some said five to nine, which is pretty accurate. Some said 10 to 14, which was never the case. Uh, and, and a similar percentage believed that others drive the same. So this top box shows that 41% uh, said five to nine, but another, more than a third, said that you would be able to go 10 to 14 miles an hour over. This indicates that one, they don't know really what the Dimmler Amendment is. Two, that they did believe there was some fudge factor to what is otherwise a black and white issue, at least on the colors of the sign, right? And they believed in similar proportions that uh, other people were driving uh, at the same rate. So uh, it's probably OK for, for me to go that fast because other people are going that fast. 
Another survey that was done in 2009 that we used in this Dimmler research was a, a survey question that asked, how fast do you think you, will go you can go before you'll be stopped? Now, in that case, we saw, we saw a majority said that they could be stopped for going anything over the posted speed limit. That's fairly good, although if only half the people are driving the posted speed limit, we then see why more, possibly more than half the people are, are irritated by driving behind the slow driver. Because there's almost more than half the people out there who believe that it is their uh, ability, if not right, uh, particularly in the Twin Cities, uh, to go 10 to 15 miles an hour over. Again, this is outside of what the Dimmler piece has. So I pull these two studies together to point out that there is a real, I'm feeling like we're finding a real perception issue in terms of the safety issue related to speeding. The Dimmler Amendment complicates an already compl complicated enforcement. And I'll, I'll go to one anecdote here that uh, a few months after the study was done, I got an email followed by a fairly desperate sounding voicemail uh, from a, a University of Minnesota student. Uh, Def really wanted to talk to me based upon the work I had done on the Dimmler Amendment. And so we set up a time and the student came in. They were from Illinois where apparently you get two speeding tickets and your license is suspended for a couple of months if you are under 21, I believe. And they had, uh, as part of their job, actually ended up, or trying to get to their job, been uh, picked up for uh, speeding in Minnesota twice. Uh, one time uh, was not in Dimmler zone, and so they knew that their insurance company was going to know about it, and therefore the state of Illinois was going to know about it. The other was in a Dimmler zone. And they were getting lots of information from all sorts of directions about whether this meant they were going to be subjected to the license being suspended in Illinois, or their Illinois license being suspended. And I really could not give them a straight answer. I said, well, Department of Vehicle Services is not going to have it. And so it's not going to get to your insurance company unless for some reason they are tracking you and are able to get to the county where that citation is because that data is still there. I can't give you a good answer, uh, but now you are spending a whole lot of time trying to figure out the fate of your driver's license. Uh, whereas in a situation where 55 means 55, yeah, you'd be out of the license and in the month you've spent trying to talk to people about it, you'd be halfway th toward getting your license suspension over with. And you maybe would have not sped in the first place because you would have known of the certainty of that uh, enforcement action. The other side of this is another anecdote that the recording does probably reduce insurance premiums and as part of the study we discovered there are uh, a decent number of people running around in Minnesota with repeated speeding violations that have not had their driver's license suspended because it's in Dimmler and therefore uh, not tracked. Um, and actually, this was uh, the point of uh, Charlie Dimmler when he got it passed. I know this because shortly after there was a, a TV uh, uh, news report about the results of this study, I got a call from Charlie Dimmler who really wanted me to know how much money had been saved uh, by all these folks who did not have higher insurance premiums. And uh, I was like, well, that's great. but." What's the impact on safety? Um, the data is available regardless anyway. And in terms of the actual reduction of insurance premiums, the insurance companies have gotten fairly smart. They have learned there are other ways to determine whether somebody is a driving risk besides just whether you have a speeding violation. For example, high correlations between credit scores and your driving, whether you're a dangerous driver. So it may be that people are not saving that much money anyway. So what are my recommendations carrying forward here? One is 
we've got an issue in, what, in people recognizing that speed is a problem. And I don't know if I've convinced you to make sure you're following the speed limit when you go home later or to your next destination, but nonetheless, that was one of my, my hopes. Um, but we do see regular uh, uh, speeding uh, over the posted speed limit, and stakeholders don't see that this uh, necessarily uh, is an issue that requires addressing. In particular, younger and male drivers seem to be a problem. This is something the Department of uh, Public Safety has identified explicitly in another study. Um, and possibly uh, the, the, the message needs to be mostly directed at uh, that audience. Um, and we'll have to just see about that. But we ultimately need to create an environment where speeders uh, need to be seen as endangering others as a public safety issue and that the enforcement of violating the speed limit actually is a certain thing rather than one that's pretty fuzzy and depends upon where you are and who you're talking to and, and so forth. So that maybe, yeah, you can go a little over the speed limit anyway. So thanks for the attention. That's uh, what I've got to say and I'd be happy to take any questions. Um. Just want to remind everybody in asking questions, you need to use a microphone so that people uh, who are off in uh, internet land uh, know what your questions are. Are there any questions here in the room? You mentioned that um, in, in earlier in the presentation that one of the sentiments from respondents was ASC doesn't work or won't work. Do you think they were kind of hitting at a lack of trust in this system because I feel like that's kind of a common pop culture critique of the red light cameras that you know oh it caught me doing this but it wasn't that or do you think that um, it's more of a safety culture question of speeding is not a problem it tended to be more in the the former that uh, it, it wouldn't work as designed um, you know that it'll catch people who aren't speeding or uh, it will catch uh, the wrong person um, something like that um, as, as opposed to, to the latter, but uh, uh, that, that, that also was, was in there too, I think. Other questions? Yeah, Frank, uh, quite a few years ago, I sat in on a presentation by a local police officer, okay, no names will be mentioned, okay, <laughs> to a local professional organization. I won't mention that either. But anyway, the essence of what that officer was saying was the courts uh, essentially refused to have anything to do with the speeding citations that are more than 11 miles an hour over the limit, and so the officers don't bother to deal with those. 11 Is miles over or under the limit? Over the limit. Got to be going at least 11 miles an hour over the limit, okay, for the court to, for the court to pay bother attention. with it, I guess. Yeah. Is that still the case, or was that an exaggeration at that time? What do you think is going on there? Um, as part of this study, I didn't get any particular, you know, none of the, the judges we talked with said that, uh, you know, we don't pay attention to, to, to that sort of, to a, a less than, you know, 10 mile an hour violation or anything like that. Uh, but I think um, that is at least a common perception. We saw it in the, uh, um, in, in, in the uh, surveys that we looked at for the Dimmler project. Uh, similarly, it explains uh, the support for automated speed enforcement at, say, 15 miles an hour over the speed limit or more. Um, it, uh, uh, I, I think there's a perception uh, also out there that uh, um, the radars just aren't accurate to something less, less than that. Um, so I can't say in particular whether courts, because we didn't get any, any court officials to fess up that they, they don't pay attention to that. But uh, I think that probably also um, we see that, that perception go through in the way people are behaving and, and, and so forth. And probably why there is opposition to something that to to on all roads at any speed over because people don't believe that's being enforced right now. Got another one back over there. 
Um, is automated speed enforcement um, being enforced in other parts of the country? Um, and if it is, what have been the results on public reception? What have you seen that? And then um, also in terms of how, how did they make that happen and get that through? Um, automated speed, as I mentioned, automated speed enforcement is allowed in 15 states. Uh, in many cases, it's the state simply saying cities are allowed to do it. Oftentimes, it's in uh, it's it's a sort of a, a blanket uh, um, in, uh, uh, allowing them to do it, and that you can uh, use remote means to enforce speed or red lights or both. Um, but it's you know city by city uh, sort of situation. Um, in the cases where there have been uh, analysis, there has been a finding that it reduces speeds, uh, reduces crash rates, and severity. There, um, the, the most prominent studies I know of are in Arizona, where also uh, the political ramifications of that were that the whole state rebelled and they now outlawed automated speed enforcement in the whole state. So the safety question did not get carried through to the populace. Uh, it didn't help that the governor talked publicly about how much money the state was making from this. Um, that did not, uh, again, we had a finding of this should be only for public safety, not for other purposes, and that kind of violated that rule. Um, a state where it has been uh, accepted and um, remains in force is Illinois, where automated speed enforcement is used in work zones. And it was passed there after a very bad year where they had several workers die in, in work zones. And uh, the legislature felt something needed to be done. And so the uh, political will was made in fairly unfortunate circumstances to get that passed. There's a question um, online. And uh, they, had, they said, I'm curious if automated speed enforcement cameras are likely to increase certain types of crashes. For example, red light cameras sometimes contribute to rear end crashes. Um, you could see that uh, if you had people suddenly slowing down when they knew it was an automated speed enforcement zone, sort of this halo effect, you could see the, uh, that sort of um, uh, rear end crash happening. The uh, question that, that comes if you're going to ask this question of increased crashes and different ty types of crashes is that uh, which is worse, a run off the road or even head on collision at an, a speed over the speed limit um, or a rear ending crash that the difference in speeds is maybe 10 to 20 miles an hour. You're de dealing with a property damage crash versus what's probably a severe injury or a fatality. Let me throw in a few questions. <laughs> uh, what happens if all income from, for example, automated speed enforcement, you know, assuming uh, we have uh, only people going more than 15 miles an hour over the speed limit, so the extreme speeders. If all that money was collected in a pot and all good drivers received a credit every year based on the money that comes in. In other words, let's reward the drivers who are safe using the money that's generated by the fines that come in from automated speed enforcement. You think that would change the way people support this kind of a policy? Well, if it's enough money, it might cause people to want to see it been forced down to one mile an hour over. But uh, <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, that we we didn't put that question uh, out there, so you know I, I don't know the data. But again, there is we did see support for the idea that this is done to encourage safety. Safety did carry the day. So if it is done in a way that rewards more safe behaviors. I would imagine uh, that would be more supported than uh, something that says, um, look, that we've, we've been able to re refurbish the floors in City Hall because we now are catching people for speeding down Main Street. Uh, since I don't have it, let me throw another one at you. 
Uh, we've all uh, drive along roads and there are police uh, deployed radar signs so that we see uh, I'm driving 10 miles an hour. I can see the speed that I'm driving. What if next to that we had a display that showed my license plate as I'm driving at speed? You, license plate XYZ, are speeding at, and you can actually see mm -hmm. your speed. In other words, we don't record it. We simply display it to you. Do you think that would be legal? As far as legality, not political acceptability, but legality, uh, yes, because there is, this is the US Supreme Court saying there is no uh, expectation of privacy in your movement on the public thoroughfare. And your license plate is visible to everyone. So uh, putting a nice 60 inch television next to the speed display that shows the bumper of your car and your license plate and the speed you're going. You know, we've, we've seen people slow down even just when, with the simple your speed signs, uh, at least uh, over the short term. Um, the question is, you know, what becomes the long term thing? If this becomes just sort of a, a, an interesting thing and, no, and, the, and the, the, the law is never actually enforced without a further incentive such as the community saying, um, you're, you're causing a problem by driving that fast. I don't know if it would have a long-term effect. But on the other hand, if, uh, if, if there's a ticket that's issued every once in a while and that is then going back to the lowering the premiums of everybody else driving in that community, they might line up to make sure that that fast person has to slow down. It, uh, it, but it, there, there needs to be another incentive to, to back it up, I think. Any other questions? Well, uh, let's uh, wrap it up and please join me in thanking our speaker uh, for a rather interesting and controversial topic. Um, and next week, uh, we are going to have uh, Hadi Medani speaking, uh, same time, same place, on predictive modeling of rail track geometry defects towards improved safety and maintenance. I'm sure all of you have uh, certainly heard much of the news and concern about uh, major uh, rail crashes and, uh, and trains that turn over, et cetera. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, various methods of predicting uh, when uh, the rail begins to deteriorate and needs to be replaced before uh, trains uh, fall over, so to speak. Anyway, that's next week. Uh, any of you who are registered for the class and have any questions about the seminar, uh, please see me uh, right now after class, or you can email me at another time. Thank you.